All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I uh, get very excited about this topic, so I want to make sure I have enough time to, to fit everything in here and still have time for some QA. Uh, hi, my name is Tom Martin. I am a senior technology consultant at Metal Toad. Uh, we are a digital agency out of Portland, Oregon in the United States. Uh, we focus primarily on Drupal-based projects. I found my way into the Internet back in the in mid-late 90s, got very excited about it, and yet somehow became an animator instead. Uh, and then somehow found my way back into doing web-based work and development and uh, spent a lot of time doing e-commerce and at some point wound up at Metal Toad, learned Drupal, and, and I've been there ever since. Uh, so this session summarized is basically at Metal Toad we've been experiencing this phenomenon recently where a lot of clients are coming to us and they have these very big grand ideas. Uh, but they don't necessarily know how to make these ideas a reality. You know, what does the project actually look like? What does this actually mean to produce this thing that they have in their heads? And so we've been doing a lot of discovery projects lately, and I wanted to come here uh, today and, and uh, share a little bit of this, some of the things we've learned with you folks. So what exactly am I talking about when I talk about a discovery project? Discovery project is essentially just a small project to define the big project. You know, it's planning, it's defining the goals, it's doing requirements gathering, it's plotting out a roadmap, and it's determining the scope so that you can actually estimate or even have some sense of how many sprints the big project's going to be. More importantly than that, it's a fantastic opportunity to build trust between yourself and the client. How many of you have ever done any of these types of things before? Right. I mean, I'm not, you know, reinventing the wheel here in any way. All I'm simply doing is, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of these practices and processes and combined it into a service that our company can provide to the client. So which customers, you know, does this really apply to? It's not every project. It's not every client. You know, there's a little bit of a spectrum. You know, on one end, you kind of have your fairly basic websites. Think of these as brochure wear sites. I mean, this could be a restaurant that needs to post their menu or locations. These are very easy. You know, typically they're going to be marketing based. Uh, a lot of the requirements are going to be dictated by the, the design comps. So do you really have to do a thorough discovery on these? You know, maybe not. But of course, on the other end of the spectrum, you have these large monolithic ERP systems. These are very, very large architecture. You know, think of Starbucks and, you know, internationally, the types of systems that they have to support for, you know, not only, you know, the point of sale, but supply chain, you know, HR. You know, these are massive systems. And that's not really what I'm talking about here either, because when you get into that scale, you're starting to talk about some form of architecture framework. What I'm talking about is what I like to refer to as our little discovery project Goldilocks zone. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's somewhere right in the middle. Um, the way I like to think about it is as, as the web evolves and as we start to see more and more that what constitutes a web project is becoming more complex, those of us that were in the agencies of, in, and in the business of building websites are starting to see these more complex requirements coming in. And as a result, we have to do a little bit more thorough planning ahead of time to just make sure we know what exactly it is we're embarking on. All right, so we need to do some planning. And one thing that I absolutely love to do is to take lessons from other industries. Uh, let's, let's face it, we're a relatively young form of media. I mean, we've matured a lot in recent years. We've been around for a while now. But in the grand scheme of the world, web is still pretty young. And there's folks that have been doing things a lot longer than we have. So let me ask you this. Imagine if an animation studio went out and they just wanted to make a movie and they decided on day one they were just going to start animating. Just right away, you know, they're starting to render stuff by day two. How do you think that movie is going to turn out? It's going to be pretty terrible. It's, it's safe to say. Uh, what are the odds that they're going to be around to make another movie? Not very high. And why do they do all this planning up front? You know, because simply it takes a lot of time and effort to make animation. You know, three seconds of film is going to take them a lot of time. Now, I think everyone in this room probably realizes that the work we do takes a lot of time also. 
I know probably most of us have been nights and weekends, and, and we, we know very well how painful and how long these things can take. So, again, let's take some lessons from these other folks. One of my favorite quotes, one of my animation professors used to say all the time, is that if I had three days to animate a scene, I'd take two days to plan and one day to animate it. This was from Eric Larson. He was one of the brilliant nine old men from Disney's golden years. But this is just another way to say something you've heard many other ways, many other times. Uh, like in carpentry, when they say, you know, measure twice, cut once, it's the same thing. And so how do they plan an animation? The very first thing they do is draft a script. This is the core of the story. Basically, nothing moves forward until they feel like this is, this is panning out. At the end of Toy Story 3, or Inside Out, or any of these recent Pixar movies, it was not the ray tracing algorithms that made you teary-eyed at the end. It was the story. It was the characters. The next thing they do in animation is conceptual design. They develop the characters, the layouts, the color palettes, locations, and they start to figure out how all of these different objects are going to connect. You know, basically, what, you know, what are your objects? What are their methods? What are their properties? Sound familiar? Storyboarding is where most of the magic happens. They do quick sketches, rapid ideation, budget-friendly experimentation. If something isn't working, they can throw it out, they can do it early, and they can move on with production. Once they have their storyboards, they can throw these together into an animatic. They actually drop it in with the audio clips. So at this stage, they pretty much know how long the movie's going to be, they know how long all the shots are going to be, and they can run this in front of a test audience. So that by the time they actually get down to doing the animation, they pretty much know whether or not the movie's going to be successful or not. And if not, they can change it. So over 100 years of grueling work has taught animators how to plan in order to avoid costly budget failures. So what can we do? You know, what's the equivalent in our industry? You know, user stories, tech specs, diagrams, wireframes, flowcharts, you know, IA, UX, you know, prototypes. These are all things you've heard of and done before. So what is the discovery project? It's our script, it's our conceptual design, it's our storyboards, it's our you know, animatics. It's basically our way of making sure that when we get down to building this thing, we're on the right track, and it's going to most likely be successful. And if not, we'll know before we start. So let's take a quick, couple quick brief looks at why we would do a discovery project. For me, personally, most of this all boils down to one thing, and that's narrowing the cone of uncertainty. Have any of you heard of this concept? So essentially, the cone of uncertainty is when you walk into a new project, especially with a new client, there can be a massive amount of things you don't know. And you basically want to try to whittle that down to some degree so that when you and your team start to actually go into production, you have some level of confidence. So if you're doing Agile, do you still need to do a discovery project? I get this question all the time, and my answer is, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Uh, you know, at Metal Toad, we, we try to do Agile as best as any agency model can. Uh, of course, the clients always throw a monkey wrench into Agile when, when you're dealing with many clients. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. There's no reason why you can't do a little bit of discovery up front. Because if you think of Agile, you're kind of saying that at the very end of the project, you're going to be the most informed to make decisions. Well, if you think about how that plays with our animator friends, not very well, you know. But there's nothing that says even with Agile you can't do some homework ahead of time, some research, to make sure you at least know how many sprints you're going to need or how about how many resources you're going to need. Do you have to narrow the cone of uncertainty very far in Agile? Not necessarily. You can start development maybe a little bit further down because Agile is going to give you a lot more flexibility when you get into your sprint structure. But of course, if you're doing waterfall, you're going to want to get that very, very far down before you start development. You're not going to want to run into any surprises. Otherwise, that's going to be on you. You're going to be eating that budget. Most important thing, though, is that you and the client are ready to move forward. You both feel confident. You both feel like you know what you're embarking on. Where that line between discovery and development 
lands, that's going to be variable. It's going to depend on how agile the client's going to be willing to be. It's also going to depend on how many requirements are already set in stone and not flexible. But you definitely want to be able to define some boundaries. If you're doing agile, like I was mentioning earlier, you want to at least be able to know about how many resources you need and what skill sets they need to have. And you're going to want to know about how many sprints that you're going to need them for. Because if you want to be able to look at your pipeline and plan your future projects, you've got to have some sense of where this, this big project's going to land and when it's going to be over. And of course, if you're doing waterfall, you're back to the old iron triangle, scope, cost, and time. Uh, and you're going to want to lock those down as best you can to protect yourself. So what some of you may be thinking is this is all great and fine to think about all this planning, but you have a business to run and you've got to be able to get paid. And it is a lot of work. But don't forget that I am saying project. The word project is in Discovery Project, and that's exactly how you should pitch it to your, pro your clients. You should be able to get billable hours for this. When you're trying to pitch this to a client, if they don't like the term discovery project, try a word they might be more familiar with, like consultation or strategy. When we go in and we try to pitch a, a discovery, I mean, this is, again, the hard part. You've got to kind of guess how long is it going to take you to determine all the variables. It's a little bit like what came first, chicken or the egg, because the whole point of discovery is to help find out how complex the big project is. So it's a little hard to tell just how much time you need to spend up front. Uh, it's an art form, I guess, but what we try to think about is if we can ballpark how big we think the big project is, we try to get at least 3 to 10% of that is a discovery budget. Uh, and the, there is a little bit of decent sized variance, variance there, and a lot of that depends on you know, just how much time we think, we think we're going to have to spend doing R&D to, to research any of the components. But believe it or not, these projects can actually be very easy sales to large businesses. Like when you're talking to an enterprise client, someone who's used to doing digital projects, this is not a hard sell. Uh, I myself, first coming into all this type of thing, I thought it would be. Uh, but but that's, that's be blunt. Uh, at least in the United States, I don't know about here in Europe, but in the United States, there is a huge percentage of digital projects that fail. And enterprises that work with many vendors and do many digital projects are aware of this. And so essentially, when you go to pitch this to them, you got to keep in mind that they love planning and documentation. You know, they absolutely love narrowing, you know, the estimate ranges and getting that ballpark to be something a little bit more tangible that they can take to the financial teams. And they love minimizing risk. You know, from their standpoint, a discovery project, it's going to lower the cost, most likely, and lower the risk of the entire engagement. You got to remember a lot of these C-suites, these directors that are putting, you know, they're putting their butts on the line to get these projects through. And they're people just like you and I. They want to be comfortable. And they want to know that these large engagements, these large budgets that they're trying to get through through their corporation are going to be successful. And you're basically giving them an insurance policy that it will be. And the process scales. You don't have to think about it as this huge monolithic thing. It can be fairly small. You know, for relatively you know, straightforward, not complex sites that maybe just have one or two complex elements, maybe an integration or two, you know, those we can just do some fairly quick, maybe just like a two-day discovery even, uh, where we, we're really just looking at that integration, we're looking at the API, we're making sure we understand it, that we understand the requirements and the communication methods. And then from there, you know, the rest of it might be fairly easy. We've also been pushing a lot lately for what we call, you know, sprint zero on our projects. You know, this might be a very light sprint. It might only be one week. It might not be full time. But it brings the actual production team together and gets them in a room. And a lot of this actually involves, you know, starting to build out the backlog. You know, ideally, they've got a product owner available. I'll, I'll talk more about product owners in a minute. Um, but it, it's essentially, you know, getting, getting the planning phase together when maybe not a full-blown discovery is necessary, but at least get the team planning and identifying some of the, uh, the complex situations uh, or, or higher priority tasks. Though, of course, on the opposing side of that, we've done some discovery projects that have lasted multiple months. Uh, these are very large engagements. 
and they have decent sized budgets. Uh, we've had some discovery projects where the budget for the discovery was bigger than some of our smaller brochureware marketing sites. All right, enough with that. Uh, let's get to the how. Uh, so before we, we write our script, you know, we've got to go into step one. And step one is we've got to actually go out and talk to people. We've got to listen to some people. Before we go too deep, we have to learn to accept our own limitations. Most of us are developers by trade. Not all of us. I mean, there's people that come into the Drupal world from, from various ways. Uh, but... Uh, most of us are fairly technical-minded. And what we have to remember is that while we may know technology and software better than most people out on the street, the people in these companies that we're working with, they're going to know their jobs a lot better than we do. They know all the little details, the gotchas, the little things that we don't know, and nor should we. But if we really want to make magic happen, we've got to learn to meet in the middle. We've got to know where our institutional knowledge stops and where theirs picks up. Before we run out and interview just anybody, because interviews are a huge part of this process, you've got to be able to absorb and listen. Uh, you've got to be able to take in everything that they're saying before you make your opinions. Uh, but before we go out and do that, you've got to identify who you want to talk to. Of course, you're going to want to talk to whoever's funding the project. If there's a director involved, uh, someone in middle management, yeah, they're, they're, again, they're putting their, their reputation on the line with this project. You've got to make them happy, of course. However, are they going to be the ones that actually use the software you build? Maybe, but, but maybe not. You want to try to find the actual users of your system and talk to them. And look at the users that are using whatever system they have today. In an increasingly global world, it's very important to pick how you're going to communicate with these folks. You know, I'm a huge fan of body language. Not so much of doing it, even though I make weird gestures, uh, but, but I'm a huge fan of observing it. You know, they say body language can be up to 55% of human communication, and I think that is very true. So if you can, when you do these interviews, go in person. If it's possible to physically be there, it's worth it. If you've got to add some budget to the discovery project for flights, for travel, do that. Uh, it's very important that you're able to observe not just you know, what they're saying, but what, what are their eyes saying? What are they thinking of? What are their hand gestures? Do, you know, are they you know, nervous? You're not going to know that if you're not there. At the very least, try to do a video chat. But whatever you do, don't try to conduct these interviews via email. Uh, that's, that's essentially almost insulting. It's, it's a waste of time. Do keep in mind that when you go out and do these interviews, some of these stakeholders may need to be put at ease. They may be a little nervous. You know, whether we want to admit it or not, people are very tribal and territorial by nature. We just are. And so when you walk into a corporation as an outside entity, talking to them about how you're going to introduce this new software, this whole new solution that's going to change the way they do their jobs every day, some people are going to be nervous. You know, if they seem hostile toward you, it's not, don't take it personal. It's not you. I went into a company recently where they had a team of eight people who their entire job was to manually take emails and, believe it or not, faxes and retype everything into one system. And then they were also retyping it all again into Excel and then emailing that out to people. And then in walks me saying how I'm going to automate their entire process. These people have, you know, it's their job on the line. They have maybe children at home. They may have to pay for their house, for their cars. Uh, were they comfortable or happy to see me when I come in there to say I'm going to automate their job? Of course not. But you have to try to make them feel at ease because in the end you do need them and you need their help. You have to be very humble with them. You have to let them know that you're going to work together and try to make things better. You have no... No ability, I mean, hopefully it's not your responsibility what their supervisors or superiors tell them to do after you automate their job. But at the very least, you need to, to cultivate a relationship with them so that you can get through this process and, and just hope that uh, there is other work for them in the company, that you're freeing them up to do something better. 
than manually retyping faxes. All right, so we're going to interview, and really the most important thing to do is to just be quiet, to just listen. And that's more difficult than it may sound. In the end, we, we are very excited people, a lot of us in Drupal. We, we really want to talk about the solution we want to provide. We really want to like have this plan of action. Uh, but we have to remember that this is not the time for us to say those, those plans. This is our time to absorb. This is our time to take in what they're saying. And after we've done that, we can form our opinions. Always remember, if you're telling someone your plan at this stage, you're not listening to what they're telling you right now in that moment. You're also going to be very surprised how much the more you hear, the more your opinions of what that ultimate solution is going to be are going to change. I do recommend you take notes during all of these, but even better yet, if you can record the conversations and follow up and take notes afterwards. Uh, if, you're, if you're not having to look down at a device or even a pen and pencil and paper, uh, then you're, you're more freed up to view that body language, those, those nonverbal cues. And you have to make sure you're actually asking the right questions, especially if you've like flown to see these people. You don't want to just be asking them yes or no questions. You want to be asking questions that make them have to think, to make them have to explain, to tell you a story. You know, you didn't fly all the way across for yes or no. You have to think of yourself as a, as a detective, and you've got to, you've got to solve this, this puzzle, this, this, this case, and you need to be looking for clues, and you only get clues by making them tell you stories. A couple questions I like to always ask. I mean, of course, there's whenever they, they start sell, saying something and you sense that there's more there, of course, tell me more about that. But a couple of good ones are like, you know, what do you want at the end of all of this? Or another good one, because a lot of, you know, especially middle management, they're uneasy about the budget. I'll ask them, other than money, what does this cost you? Or what is the risk to you if, and then propose a couple scenarios and just see how they respond to that. You do want to go into these, these interviews knowing what you want as an outcome. You want to know what you want to have at the end when you walk away. But you also want to step back a little bit and think of yourself as more like nudging or guiding the conversation. Uh, but feel free to let it go wherever they take it. More than anything, if you have the opportunity, have them give you a demo. A lot of us go into these inter enterprises and we think about how we're going to demo something. Switch the mindset. Let them demo what they're already doing. That's almost every single time I have a client walk me through what they're doing today, it radically alters my opinion of what I need to build for them tomorrow. Bonus points, when you do this, you see the solution that you have to be better than. You know you have to be better than this thing they have now, and it gives you a target. But more importantly, as they walk you through everything, it's a great opportunity for them to show you all the pain points, for you to basically see it firsthand the things that take them a long time, the things that are repetitive, these are all opportunities to make their, their next solution even better. And when you're finished, make sure you step back after all the interviews and you take some time to compare notes across them all. Uh, when, many times I go into these large corporations and you find out that one department doesn't even have any idea what the other one has been doing for years, even though they work together. Uh, I recently went to a very large distributor of, of foods and um, we talked to three different branches of the organization. And all three departments thought that one of the other three were the ones that actually entered all of their customers into their, their customer database. Still to this day, we don't know who actually does. It's got to be one of the three, but they all think it's someone else. So all right, we've listened to them, and now it's our turn to make some deliverables, some things we're going to hand off. My best advice is don't limit yourself. Out of anyone in your, your organization, if someone has to be flexible, it's going to be you. You're taking whatever it is that this client gives you, this idea, this concept, whatever it may be, and you've now got to funnel that down and whittle it to something that your team can, can actually make. And so you have to have a very diverse tool set. Now, of 
course, you're going to you know, want to be have some tools that you use frequently. You're going to want to get really good at certain ones. You're going to want to have certain uh, packages or, or, or uh, uh, plans that you execute repeatedly and you get very efficient at it. But when you see, notice that a client is, is different, be willing to go and, and experiment, to try different tools. Every client is going to be their own unique experience. And even if they're building something similar to something you've done before, odds are something's going to be different. Even down to you know, just communication styles. Before we talk about some of the tools we use at Metal Toad, just want to have an awareness or make sure that we, we all know that uh, you know, there are these larger architectural planning frameworks out there. Um, when I think about architectural planning, I like to think of city planning. Uh, I lived in Los Angeles for about 10 years. I lost years of my life driving on those roads. Because if you think about it, 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 when you've gone through cities that have been very well planned, where the infrastructure is very well organized, you really notice that compared to cities where that is not the case. Um, but when we think of architectural ecosystems, I like to—I think this is a great analogy because you've got all these different, you know, plumbing, you know, architecture, all these different connections, different systems. I think it's fairly similar. But when we get to talking about these types of, of systems, I mean, you're really going to want to basically opt for for some framework. Uh, at Metal Toad, we've been using TOGAF recently, uh, you know, the, the open group architecture framework. Uh, we've been working with a fairly large client that has been using that for years, and it did really improve our means of communicating with their internal teams. Um, these types of frameworks, each one of them could have a talk here today, so obviously I'm not going to go through them. Uh, but if you want to uh, do further research, there's great resources online. They pretty much all have training programs. And, but that's, again, not really, this is when you're talking more of the larger ERP type systems, the very, very large, uh, not really what we're talking about here today. So let's go back to talking about more, uh, slightly smaller into our Goldilocks zone again. All right, so one of the favorite, my favorite personal tools on my workbench is whiteboarding. Metal Toad, we have whiteboards in every, off, every planning room. We have whiteboards all the way down the hallways. We have every conference room. We love whiteboarding because, again, rapid ideation, very quick uh, sketches, brainstorming. If something isn't panning out, you just erase it. You move on. You know, if you can't draw, doesn't matter. The client doesn't ever have to see these. The world never has to see these. It's just the process of brainstorming. Very, very low cost of failure. Very high probability that you will stumble upon a great idea. But whatever you do, just make sure you're staying very energized and actively engaging the rest of your team. Get everyone involved. All right, so we've done our interviews, we've done some brainstorming sessions, and now it's time to write our script. Our script is our user stories. Now, what you may be thinking is the product owner is supposed to write the user stories. That's great in a perfect world, but it's not a perfect world. We're agency life. And a lot of times our product owners, you know, they're not trained. They're coming from the client a lot of times, and they don't really know what it means to be a great product owner. And at the beginning of the project, we usually have to help usher them into it. We have to help train them on how to be a product owner. So a lot of times, very often, we end up doing a lot of the initial uh, user stories. And we do it with the product owner. We work with them, and we work from the interviews. Uh, but, but we end up drafting a lot of them. Um, it's not perfect world. I uh, wish it was, uh, but, but it's not. And a lot of times you've got to remember that these, these large companies, if they're coming to an outside vendor, they probably don't have a resource available. You know, they're coming to you for a reason. They're outsourcing work to you, even if they, you know, cause they probably have their own teams. Uh, but for whatever reason, that person's either not available or already overworked. And so they're counting on you for, for many of these things. One thing to keep in mind as you write your user stories, write them for the audience that's going to read them. Uh, we played around for a while doing Gherkin, because uh, we do BHAT at Metal Toad, and we realized that when we had to get approval from the people in the companies, they weren't actually reading the stories, because Gherkin was still not uh, close enough to English. Uh, it still seemed a little nonsensical or whimsical to them, 
And so they would get partially down a few pages and just sort of zone out and not pay attention. Well, if they're not actually looking at the stories and approving them and, and moving forward, those stories are just for you. And that's, that's missing the point. You want to make sure that whoever needs to read and approve these is going to read and approve them. We do a lot of diagrams at Metal Toad because uh, a lot of times, you know, you, it's just easier to, to say something with pictures than it is with words. So this is a lot like our conceptual design where we're talking about a lot of our connections between objects and, and our methods and properties. Uh, but the first thing you kind of want to do, again, also looking at your audience. You know, you want to write it, you want to make the diagram specific to whoever you're going to have actually viewing them. Is it going to be, or th is this diagram meant for your team during development? Is it meant for the client's IT team? Or is it meant for the, the stakeholders? Or is it meant for executives? All those are going to require different styles of diagramming with different levels of complexity. Uh, you certainly don't want to hand an executive a very detailed UML document if it's not the CTO. You know, if it's the, you know, the chief marketing officer, they're not going to understand what they're looking at, most likely. We do a lot of UML. You know, of course, the bonus there, uh, unified modeling language, the bonus being that pretty much anyone who's gone through computer science has, is familiar with it. Uh, you know, people can read it, and especially if you're handing off to the client's IT team, they're going to be able to work, work their way through it. But also, don't be afraid to, you know, touch it up, make it look a little prettier. Uh, no one ever really said that you can't, especially if you do need to send this off to some of the other teams. We do a lot of process flows. Uh, these come in handy, especially when we're doing anything that involves workflow. Uh, you know, business system portals. We usually do a lot of these. It really helps communicate, you know, the different user roles and how the flow is going to go across those different swim lanes to get to a, a bottom end, end here. Uh, a lot of the times these can be referred to as user journeys. Uh, we also do a lot of, you know, system flows, user interface flows, and decision trees, which are all loosely similar to this. It's great to show the client's IT team how you see your system fitting into their existing ecosystem. You know, they should be able to see how other systems are going to interact with it. And, you know, basically what you're giving them some context around where you see your solution fitting into their existing other solutions that they already maintain. The client's IT team may also want to know exactly how this new system, what it's going to look like. You know, they may have to maintain this thing after you're finished. You know, or alternatively, if they don't, once they look at the architecture of the stack, if they feel they're not capable of maintaining it, they're going to have to have some heads up to, to go out and find someone who can, whether that be you or some other vendor. If you're going to be integrating with their other systems, it's probably a really good idea to give the client's IT team some very decent details on exactly what that connection is going to look like. They're going to know what ports you want to use, how you're going to authenticate, how the data is going to flow. You want to be able to map this stuff out for them way ahead of time. Keep in mind, enterprises are going to move a lot slower than us quick, nimble agency folks. If they need to open up firewall rules or they need to set up things on their end to enable this integration, you want to give them plenty of time, and you're going to be able to tell them exactly what they need to do. So moving on to wireframes. This is our equivalent of the storyboarding. When we break out the wireframes at Metal Toad, hands down we get the best feedback of any of our other tools, the highest quality and quantity of comments from our stakeholders. Ever hear that a picture is worth a thousand words? You can talk to the client till you're blue in the face. You can show them all the user stories you want. But as soon as you show them some diagrams, they get it. They understand. It clicks. They know what they're going to need to do with this software. At that point, they don't have to use their imagination. They're not filling in the gaps with their conceptions or potentially misconceptions of how software works. You've, you've essentially filled in all those gaps. How high fidelity you make these can vary. It depends on who's seeing them, again, and it also, of course, 
you know, how big is the budget? Do you have time to get detailed on these? If you don't, that's fine. You can do them very rapidly, uh, but as long as you're conveying the information and it creates a springboard for further conversations. Do you need to be artistic to do these? I'm not gonna lie, it certainly helps. It certainly helps if you have an artistic background or if you have a lot of uh, user, you know, UX experience, you know, if, if you've done a lot of UX. But even if not, there are some tools out there that can help you. Uh, I'm a huge fan of OmniGraffle. Uh, I like it even, there's one reason I like it even better than using Adobe products for wireframing, and that's the Stencil Kit library. Uh, you can very easily just drag and drop as fast as you can from the library right on into the page and make high fidelity wireframes incredibly rapidly, almost as fast as I can think them up. Um, the other nice thing about that stencil kit is it allows you to make custom stencil kits. So you can go in and make one that's actually branded for your company. Uh, I also do all the, the diagrams that I did previously uh, that we, we were looking at. I do all those in OmniGraffle as well, and all those little icons were from our Metal Toad stencil kit. So an added bonus there is if everyone on your team is using this same tool, uh, you can share a stencil kit, you have consistency across all your different team members. So proof of concepts. So sort of like the, uh, the animatic that the animators were doing. Uh, sometimes we do have to take all these things together and put them together in a proof of concept. A lot of times you're actually figuring out, can your team actually do the thing that you think you're able to do? Uh, for these, we say roughly about 70% confidence is about all you need to achieve. You don't want to be 50% sure that you can do this thing, because 50% sure means you're taking a 50-50 shot on your team having to work nights and weekends for there to be pain in their future. But of course, if you do 100%, well, you've probably already built most of the thing, so you're almost done. So about 70% confidence means you're, you're fairly sure you're gonna be able to build this thing, you, you, you're feeling pretty good about it, you're ready to move on. But sometimes, you don't have to write fully functional software. There are instances where you're simply still trying to, to prove that the whole concept is a good idea. Sometimes uh, clients will come to us, they've had that big crazy idea, uh, they, we've started to talk about and we've realized what this would actually look like, but they still need to you know, push it up to their executives to get approval, to get budget. And sometimes you just have to convey, you know, basically, what is this thing gonna look like? For those types of prototypes, make sure you time box them. Don't spend too much time on it. Don't plan on it being something that's gonna move into production. My, my baby brother is a civil engineer, and, uh, you know, when they go in and they make a prototype, you know, they're gonna make, with their, they're building like a new bridge, you know, they're gonna build a prototype. It's gonna be a little four foot wide balsa wood bridge. They never intend for a truck to drive down this bridge. That bridge, that balsa wood is never gonna go and be a real bridge. It serves a very important purpose, but it's temporary by nature. And I encourage, you know, you know folks in our industry, treat prototypes as temporary. We do a lot of stuff in Envision. Uh, it, if you haven't checked it out, you can, I believe there's a free demo. Uh, you can do like one project for free. Uh, it's really cool. You can upload a lot of photos, you can walk through, but most importantly, the thing I love about Envision, that, you know, I love, I love doing demos in actual code, but what actual code doesn't give you that Envision does is commenting. Uh, you're, you can invite the client and the stakeholders into Envision, they can browse around in the little mockups that you make, and they can comment right on top of things. And you can actually have conversations as you're going through the, the, uh, the process of making the wireframes and, and prototypes. Sometimes you just need a little bit more pop. You know, sometimes you just really got that, gotta get that project sold. So here's a case for a discovery project that we had done. This was for a large uh, Fortune 500 company, and the end of the discovery project was to actually give a presentation to uh, a whole, like a, basically a Shark Tank style uh, panel of C-suites and, and directors. And so what we really wanted to do when we walked in there was to, to allow them to actually touch it, to have it on an iPad, that we could pass it around, that they could actually play with a mock-up, a prototype of what the system might be. Uh, 
You just can't be tactile. And so, yeah, we went in, we did a great presentation, we did some, had some leave-behinds and did all of this stuff, but honestly, the, the, the prototype is what sold it. You know, that's the thing that, that made it happen. Now, the dirty little secret is, is that prototype is nothing but HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, we did not put a lot of time into this. You know, we put more time into the design and the concept than we did into the prototype. That was just a movie prop more than anything. Documents. So this, you know, I know we kind of talked about our script being our user stories, but these are, documents are also part of our script. So depending on the size and nature of your project, you might deliver several other documents. You know, the most important being the big discovery document. And then, of course, the statement of work, because if you've done all this work to plan for a big project, you're going to want to be able to actually say, okay, now here's what it's going to take to build it, and here's the, basically the contractual agreement. In addition to these, depending on the situation, you might be doing also a pitch deck, risk assessment, API contracts, comparative analysis, data migration plans, uh, any dozen of the available uh, deliverables that you have in your workbench. Our tool of choice for all of these is Google Docs. Beyond our team, we generally share our documents with our clients. We like to have full transparency the entire time. We highly value this transparency. We love it when our clients give us comments right down on the side. The sooner we know we're going down the wrong path, the sooner we can fix it. As a general rule of thumb for documents, again, I love taking lessons from other industries, like journalism. Have any of you ever heard of the inverted pyramid? The inverted pyramid is basically putting the most important stuff at the very top and working your way down to the stuff that if someone's not really reading, it's not very important that they don't see it. So one of the very, very first things I like to put at the very top are the things that we absolutely need to make sure that everybody sees, the critical stuff, the content that you absolutely have to have conveyed to these stakeholders. Below that, anything that's going to require them to take action. Again, as I was saying, they're going to be slower moving than us. So give them a heads up as fast as you can on anything you need from them. From there, the bulk of the actual implementation plan. What are you going to actually do? What does this look like? What are all the topics? And then at the very, very bottom is stuff that's really mostly for your team. It might be even be stuff that they all, the client already kind of knows. So the discovery document, this is the big one. This is the big thing that we deliver. You know, we, whatever we call it changes depending on the client. Whatever they want to hear, we don't care. We'll change the title. Um, but whatever you call it, this acts as the, the binder of everything that you found. It pulls everything together. Definitely keep the audience in mind when you're writing it. Who do you need to read this? Don't use jargon if they're not going to understand jargon. If they don't know Drupalisms, don't put Drupalisms in it. You know, or at least you know, keep it you know, to, to, to a point that they're going to be able to follow. When I start on one of these documents, I usually start by writing my outline first. At the very beginning of my project, I'll do the outline. All my, I'll start by doing all my H1s, and these are usually the biggest questions I have about this project. And then within each H1, I'll do some H2s. And if I have to do H3s, I'll do that too. But usually, try not to go down that deep. From there, I actually use this as my guide as I do my discovery project. Basically, I'm filling in the blanks. I'm asking all the hard questions, all the things I didn't know, and throughout the course of my discovery project, I'm filling in all the content. Does my outline change by the end of the discovery project? Probably, and that's fine. That just means you've had insights gained, and that's, that's perfectly acceptable. But it does kind of like set the, the whole path of the discovery project. Oops, I was supposed to show you that slide first. Um, the very next thing I like to show are, you know, basically some of the links to the other, other things they need to see. Make sure they know that other stuff exists. If you've got other documents, some of them may be too large to include in this one, like the user stories document. Usually that's fairly large. Or I'll link out to, like, the Envision so they can see the prototypes. You know, also very important. And at the very, very top, I like to do the project goals. I usually keep these very, very simple, not even sentences. 
Uh, these can be very simple like, you know, provide an interface for editing their catalog or increase hit rate by improving search results. Very simple. From there, I'll usually involve some of the diagrams, usually very basic high-level diagrams, not technical. Uh, this would be something that an executive could look at at one glance and understand what's happening. Then I'll do some technical, not, again, probably not the most technical ones that we've got. You know, a lot of those are going to come a little bit further down in the document. But again, higher level. If someone at a glance, even if the IT team is now looking at this, at a glance they understand what's going to happen. What are we going to build? What's the stack going to look like? I've kept this all very simple up to this point. I've kept it very visual. I've had very few words. It's because when the C-suites are looking down through this, you want them to be able to get it at a glance, you want them to feel comfortable, and then you want them to be able to feel like they can move on. They, they don't have to sit through their next 30-some pages of document that you're going to have. Because once this thing gets moving, there's going to be a lot of information. In this particular document, uh, you know, we covered quite a bit of ground. I mean, we were looking at various APIs we had to integrate. We had system security, user roles and permissions, connections to some other business-to-business -business portals, you know, tons of things, how they wanted to handle revisioning, all that stuff. But at the very bottom, the very last thing I'd like to add are some calls to action. And much like the project, uh, the, the basic objectives at the very top, very simple, not even sentences. These could be things like, Sign the yes, you know, receive and sign the, the statement of work. So the statement of work, uh, kind of at a glance, the way we handle this at Metal Toad, uh, we usually do, these are about six to ten page documents, depending uh, on, how, on the complexity. Uh, we're going to cover usually the project overview, you know, the purpose statement, the business objectives, uh, overall, the deliverables and like the success criteria. What does it actually mean to succeed in this project? You know, and then we'll also be able to look at our timeline and milestones and how many resources we plan to work on this. Those two things together are going to help us dictate the scope and the cost. We usually define roles and responsibilities, especially if there's another th one or more other third parties involved. You know, where does our work end and where does their work pick up? We talk about how we're going to do quality assurance, how we handle our maintenance, support, and warranty. And then one of my favorite sections is actually the assumptions and exclusions. This is where you kind of get to draw a nice little safety circle around your project uh, to kind of define where you, as far as you're aware, according to this contract, this is what the project uh, is not going to entail. Um, you know, a couple good topics to have in there would be, you know, handling around uh, multilingual. Um, you know, that, that, that's one that's, that's bit us in the past. Um, you know, and another great one is, you know, just down to what level of Internet Explorer are you willing to suffer? But at the very bottom, you know, we go through some of our boilerplate. We go through terms and agreements. You know, maybe some, there's some other key features specific to this project. Uh, and then, of course, at the very bottom is the signature. I mean, this is where they sign off and you do your big project. All right, so we've delivered everything. It's time to hand it off to the client. Wait, that doesn't make sense. The end of the discovery project, there should be no surprises. Ideally, you've had the client in there fully transparent the entire time. You know, they, like I was showing you earlier on the Google Docs, they've been commenting, they've been making, you know, it's been fully transparent. So the handoff really should be fairly informal. There should be no surprises had, not even in the, in the SOW. Uh, they should already know about what budget, you know, because they've been in there looking at the doc. Uh, maybe not the executives or the C-suites, but at least the directors you're, you're working with. Um, so yes, the big reveal is not for us. Uh, we don't want to, you know, walk by and be like, here's our master plan. Last thing we want to have happen is them say, that's totally off the mark. So, all right, time to celebrate. You've given them your, your uh, pro you know, your, your discovery document, your SOW, and they signed. They're ready to come in and do the big project. But your work isn't done. 
You still have to work with your team. So turn around and look at all of your team, and you've got to be able to set them up for success. Make sure you share everything with them, everything you did during your findings, you know, all the documents, everything you've got. Make sure you walk them through with those documents and that they understand everything and they know where the important stuff is. I share my whole Google Drive directory with my team. And you need to make sure that they're, they're not lost in the weeds, that they know where the important stuff is located. If you happen to have known that the project was looking like it was going to, be, to go through, start to involve the team early. Bring them in on the discovery. Have them sit on some of the interviews and some of the meetings. Uh, that way they're already partially informed. Because in the end, when all this is said and done, if your job, like in my role, I'm a consultant. I'm not going to be a developer on the project. Um, you know, I'm going to phase out as they start to actually build this project. And as I phase out, I've got to transition all that knowledge. I've got to transition the ownership. And more importantly, I've got to transition the energy. Because that entire discovery project, you've been up on a stage, and everyone's been looking at you from the client. They've been talking to you. They're used to talking to you. They're giving you all their questions. And now you're going to phase out, and you're going to walk away. If you don't have someone else from the, the actual development team carry that energy, then they're going to keep coming back to you. Their client's going to keep wanting to talk to you about things. And that's fine to a degree, but you might have other work to do. Like in my role, I've got to move on to the next discovery project. So it's very important that you identify you know, a project lead or a senior developer, you know, someone who's ideally got experience working with clients that they're going to step up and be that representation of your company with this client. Maybe it's a project manager, um, just, just someone who's going to be willing to carry that. And you're going to have some frequent check-ins. You're going to remember that you planned this project. Uh, you've, you were there for the form, formulation of what was going to be executed. So you have to be your team's compass. You have to make sure that they're following the true north that the client wants to head towards, that they've, they've got the right idea and continue on that path. So show up at some of the sprint planning sessions, show up at the demos, and certainly show up at the retros, and just make sure that everybody is, is still continuing in the right direction. So that seemed like a lot of work, but was it actually worth it? First off, let's go back and back to reality. All that stuff I talked about, you're probably not going to do all of it for every discovery project. Most discovery projects are going to be fairly small. I mean, a lot of the stuff I walked through, that, like that 30-page document, that was for one of those you know, multiple weeks, almost a month long discoveries. Uh, so there was a lot more work to that. Uh, you know, depending on the budget and the size of the project, that's going to dictate how long you actually spend on these things. But was it actually worth it? That's a very hard question to answer because, frankly, you don't know how many icebergs the ship did not hit. You didn't waste an entire sprint building something that wasn't necessary. And you knew about that crazy integration to some custom-built system that they had before you started development. So you planned for it. So whether or not it's worth it is very hard to gauge. Uh, but it's a safe bet that you're doing things right if you see a sharp decline in project escalations, pre-launch blockers, change orders, and developer face palming. The client trusts you and feels that you have a rich understanding of their business goals. Your internal champion within the client gets a promotion. A stakeholder buys you a beer. Remember, these are the people that were afraid and nervous when you first walked in. If you've taken the relationship to a point where they're willing to buy you a beer, you've worked some magic. And most importantly, you're definitely doing it right if the client becomes a partner. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd open it up for any QA if anyone has any questions. Or I, I think if you could use the mic because I believe they record, so the, the mic will actually go through. Hi. Uh, a lot of that's 
A lot of what you said really rings true for me. Uh, one of the questions I have is around when you're doing user research is a huge part of your discovery process. One of the difficulties I've had selling this in is that you know in your heart when you get uh, a request from a client and they don't understand their users. What they have asked for is totally stupid. <laughs> and you're going to have to go in there and say, in the most polite terms possible, when this touches an actual user, you, all of your assumptions in this document are going to change radically. There's no point in me pitching for what you've got now. So what I'd like to uh, hear, if, if you've had any experience of that kind of pitch where y you're going to have to radically alter what their, what their business goals are, what their assumptions are with users. Absolutely, and you're, you're right. That is a huge challenge, and it does come up very frequently. A great example I have of this just happened recently where I'm working with a fairly new client, and uh, we're, we're doing one system for them, but then we, we started talking about this other one. And um, to put it in perspective, you know, they're going to, a lot of times these stakeholders in the clients, they're going to stick with what they know. And in this case, they knew FileMaker 4. And so they were, they've been spending the last three years building this system based on FileMaker 4. And when you put that in perspective, FileMaker 4 came out in, I think, 1997. Um, but it's what they know. And so you're, in that case, it was a terrible idea. And that's what they thought that their users would, were going to want to use. It was an internal tool, and they had a lot of users internal to the company. And you're right, it was a delicate situation because I knew it was just a terrible, 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 terrible idea. Uh, and it's like, how do you communicate that? And it, you know, the first thing I think you got to do is you've got to you got to be somewhat humble, and you can't just shoot them down because they've been working very hard, or it's their idea and they cherish it. And you have to be sensitive to that. You have to have empathy, and you got to get them to explain certain things about that. And maybe as you start to have them explain, ask questions, not necessarily pointed, but directional, that get them to kind of start to admit some of the potential downfalls. And if they can see those holes themselves, if they, if they even steer the direction towards them saying some of those holes in their plan out of their own mouths, you know, a lot of times that's going to go a long way. And then once they've kind of started to, to question things, you know, a lot of times it's, I find it very useful to start to discuss, well, have you thought about these other solutions? Have you checked this out? You know, and start to, like, feed them better ideas. And, and ideally, if you do it right, they almost think it's their idea to switch it up to this other thing. Um, it's not really manipulation per se, because um, you're actually helping them. You're helping steer them towards, you're, you're steering them towards a better solution. But yes, it's incredibly challenging. <laughs> Very sensitive. Any other questions? All right, guess we're, uh, we're all set. Thank you all very much.